afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Oceanside Library Lecture on the Origins and Significance of the American Civil War. This year marks the 160th anniversary of the start of the American Civil War. To present this lecture is Martin Levinson, who has written and lectured extensively on topics of historical interest. Thank you for being here with us today, Martin. Take it away. Well, thank you. And uh, I let's say I can't see you. I can only see myself and the background <laughs> that I put on. This is not where I live <laughs> that you think it is. And I'm not orbiting the earth as I joke with Aaron, but this is a background that the iPad provides me that I thought was kind of cool. So I'll just leave it up there. But anyway, thank you all for coming today. As I said, it's a nice day. You could have been elsewhere, but you're here to learn about the uh, little bit about the Civil War and its significance. And um, it's interesting because it does have quite a bit of significance. You know, we're a divided nation, as you know, today. It's obvious. Uh, you don't have to read the news to figure it out. But I mean, obviously, in the news, it's like you know, Republicans against Democrats, the South against the rest of the country. Maybe that's how they feel. And a lot of it has to do with the Civil War. So uh, let's get to it right away. So again, if you have questions, if you don't want to ask them in the chat, um, feel free to ask them as I'm speaking. I don't mind um, taking questions in the middle of my talk, and then I can answer them. And then after satisfaction, when I finish, I'll allow some time for uh, questions, and we can do it then. So it's actually no problem. And I'm going to uh, actually do a PowerPoint here, if I can get it. Let's see. Uh, okay, and Civil War. Okay, so the origins and significance of the Civil War. Uh, actually, uh, it starts out in many ways with the Declaration of Independence, but even before that. Uh, but let me give you some background. So the American Civil War has been written about as few other wars in history. There are more than 60,000 books and countless articles which give eloquent testimony to the accuracy of poet Walt Whitman's prediction that a great literature will arise out of the era of those four years, which is true. Now, some have called the American Civil War the last of the old fashioned wars. Others have termed it the first modern war. And actually it was a transitional war and it had a profound impact technologically on the development of modern weapons and techniques. There were many innovations. It was the first war in history in which iron clad warships clashed. The first in which the telegraph and railroad played significant roles the first to use extensively rifled ordnance and shell guns and to introduce a machine gun, which was the Gatling gun. It was the first to have wide, oh, I'm sorry, widespread newspaper coverage, voting by servicemen in the field in national elections and photographic recordings. It was the first to organize medical care of troops systematically and the first to use land and water mines to employ a submarine that could sink a warship. It was also the first war in which armies employed aerial reconnaissance, and they did that not by airplanes, but by balloons. So almost 3 million men fought in the war, 2.1 million for the North, about 800,000 for the South, and roughly 620,000 to 750,000 were killed. So you can see that's a fairly wide range. And the fact is um, almost every month, it's, you're reading new stuff as documents seem to be uncovered, uh, revising that, but it's anywhere between 620 and 750. That's what most historians say, which is, which is more people that died in all of other wars, at least till after the Vietnam War. Now, 60% of the deaths in the war were due to disease. More people died in the Civil War, I mentioned that. Only one in four Southern farmers owned slaves. So sometimes people say, well, they were all fighting in the South, all the men were fighting because they wanted to keep their slaves. Well, in fact, only one in four owned slaves. So the question is, why did the others fight? You can understand why slave owners might fight. They don't want to give up uh, the slaves, which were responsible for their, uh, how well they were doing economically. Uh, and we'll talk about that. Anyway, by the war's end, Blacks made up 10% of the Union Army. They were, all, they were only 1% of the wars of the North's population. So basically what happened is uh, Lincoln freed the Southern slaves, this is in the Confederacy with the Emancipation Proclamation. Once they were free, they came and joined the army, uh, many of them. And so many of them fought on the Northern side. So let's see what it looked like North compared to South. At the time of the Civil War, there were 21 million people living in the North and only 9 million living in the South. So the North had more than double the population of the South. 
The South was composed of 11 states. I'm sorry, the North was composed of 11 states. The South, the North was composed of 23 states. The South was compared of 11 states. So the North had twice as many states. Uh, whites in the North had twice the per capita, I'm sorry, my thing is wrong here. Whites in the South had twice the per capita income compared to whites in the North. So, you know, we think today that the South is a less economically successful part of the country, which is true. But back then, the wealth, more of the wealth in the country was in the South than in the North. And really that had to do with slavery. I mean, imagine you had a business and you could get free labor. Well, you pretty good profits. You don't have to pay the labor, no benefits, no wages, not bad. In a way, the South was like Saudi Arabia. They were rich from cotton instead of oil, but kind of similar. You can call it the kingdom of the South in many ways. Uh, the South, at the time of the Civil War, right before it, it had the fourth largest economy in the world. So I mean, it was huge. But the North had 70% of the railroads and it had 90% of the skilled workers. Because cotton was so prevalent, the South really didn't put up many factories and didn't have really many other industries. Like in Saudi Arabia, when the oil goes, they're gonna to have to transition to something. Well, the South had a transition after the Civil War when their slaves went, but before they didn't. Okay, so this is of course the Declaration of Independence where you know all men are created equal, but that wasn't the truth, right? Because if all men were created equal, the same rights and liberties, they certainly didn't have that if you were black. And so that was what's sometimes called original sin. And original sin was the slavery that was actually then written into the constitution, okay? So that means we should really talk a little bit about slavery because that was the primary cause for the war. So the first slaves were brought to America in 1619. New York Times last year did something called the 1619 Project in which they talked about the slaves. And that's really where they get the year. And slavery was allowed in the US Constitution. It's right there in the Constitution, slavery was allowed. And as a matter of fact, it was used for voter representation. So although the slaves couldn't vote, they were counted for, in terms of allocating representatives, slaves were counted as three fifths of a person. So you had, so the South had extra political power even though they didn't have the voters. That was that three fifths voting clause. But also in the constitution, basically it said that the importation of slavery was prohibited in 1808. So they were figuring in eh, 15, 20 years down the road, we'll get rid of slavery importation and that'll sort of maybe put a crimp in slavery, but it didn't. It didn't because the slaves, of course, you know, they were here, the men and women got together, they had children. And so they had enough children, the South didn't have to worry about importing slaves. You had enough slaves here and because they were, you know, having children, that they didn't have to worry about importing slaves from outside regions. So slavery was, um, but I mean, there were plenty of people in the North that were against slavery. They thought it was morally wrong. Some people in the South too, but it wasn't good to really admit it in the South because so many people were for slavery. In many ways, economically, it made so much sense to these people. I mean, you know, we'd get all these workers that are working for us. And there was some strong beliefs that the blacks were not equal to whites. In terms of ability, brain power, skills, that was a common belief even among Northerners uh, back in the 19th century. Anyway, in 1820, there was something called the Missouri Compromise, because at the time the country wasn't like today with 50 states or even 48 continental states. Um, there were new states coming into the Union. And so uh, there was an agreement called the Missouri Compromise, and that was that Missouri came in as a slave state when they came into the Union in 1820. But slavery would be prohibited north of the 3630 parallel, kind of above Missouri, you couldn't have slavery. And that was, that was the compromise. So that kept the country together for a little bit. In 1828, there was something called the Tariff of Abominations, which was a tariff which left the British with less money to buy Southern goods. And when that came in, some in the South really wanted to secede, particularly South Carolina. They said, well, oh, you're putting a tariff on goods, the British won't buy enough of our goods, we'll leave the Union. And at that point, Andrew Jackson, who was the president, said, if you succeed, South Carolina, I'm gonna march in there with an army and I'm, I'm a general, I'll lead that army. 
So we scared South Carolina into not doing that. So there's a, uh, a picture of slaves brought to the US. I mean, it was a horror. They would be packed in in these, you know, these boats and uh, ships. And uh, you know, many would die and they'd be thrown overboard if they were dead. I mean, it's almost like, uh, you know, you see hear about chickens today in little coops. You could argue these were people in coops. It was a nightmare. By the way, it's a wonderful museum. Now that COVID is kind of under control and people, if you're vaccinated, I guess can go into museums. So if you're ever in DC, there's a great museum, the um, African uh, American Museum, I get the exact title, but um, you could easily spend a day there. I spent a half a day there because we had a busy schedule and I regret it. So the next time I go back, I'm spending another half day, but it's wonderfully put together. And you really get a sense of what it was like to be a slave, what slavery was like. And uh, I really think it should be, you know, we should fly everyone in the country to spend a day there. It would be, it would be good for race relations, I think. If you really, people really knew how horrible it was. Okay. Uh, so there's uh, one of the uh, folks um, I'll talk to him about later, John C. Calhoun from the South, very pro-slavery. The South had a lot of um, pro-slavery folks. The North had, of course, the anti-slavery. They, they were called abolitionists in the North. They wanted to abolish slavery. They felt it was wrong that no person should own another person. And so these were abolitionists. Many of them were in uh, the New England states, uh, you know, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts had a bunch. Uh, and so uh, we'll talk about the, the 19th century now, the 19th century antecedents to the Civil War. So in, uh, in 1830, by the way, um, I'll just go back to the uh, 18th century. So what happened in the 18th century, once slavery, once the slaves were here in 1619, it slowly but surely it found uh, slavery became institutionalized. And in the uh, 18th century, which is the 1700s, um, in the South, you had uh, from about 80 years in the South, there wasn't a report of one single instance of a black woman being raped. It's interesting, this wasn't done. And in a Virginia decision, uh, they decided, well, when you have a child, is the lineage passed down from the mother or the father? Now, you know, typically it was the father, but in the South, they said, no, it'll be passed down from the mother. So if a slave owner had sex with a slave, slave and it resulted in a child, the child, because the lineage was from the mother, would be a slave. Because the lineage was from the father, they'd be free. And maybe, you know, would have to get property from the father. But no, it was decided that that child, the lineage would be from the mother. So the system was rigged from the start. It's really sad. Okay. So let's go to 1830, the decision North Carolina v. Man. It's a famous decision in which the Supreme Court ruled that slave owners had absolute authority over their slaves and could not be found guilty of committing violence against them. So if the slave did something he didn't like, whip away, lash away, you weren't gonna be prosecuted. And of course, many of, the, uh, many of the slaveholders were cruel and so were their wives, by the way. There's some books on that. Okay, in 1848, there was something called the Wilmot Proviso and the Wilmot Proviso named after the Senator Wilmot of Delaware was designed to eliminate slavery within the land acquired as the result of the Mexican War. And it's a pretty famous war. It was where we fought in the uh, 1846 to 1848, which we grabbed a whole bunch of land. And so Wilmot wanted to say we wouldn't have slavery in, in that land, and um, it was voted down. But he tried to, uh, and this was the big, this was actually one of the main reasons why the Civil War was caught. It wasn't just the slavery. It was that new states were coming into the union and the South was worried if enough of these two states did not have slavery in them, they'd eventually be outvoted and the country would be such a heavy populace they didn't have slaves that the sentiment would be pro anti-slavery. And so the South wanted to make sure that as new slaves came into the union, at least half of them would be slaves that allowed, would be states rather that allowed slavery. And uh, that didn't happen. And that was really one of the reasons, probably the main reason for the Civil War. Okay, so in 1852, a very famous book is published, Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
The author of that book is Harriet Beecher Stowe, who actually really wasn't a professional author. That was, I think, her first big book. And um, it was such a popular book. It was second biggest bestseller in the United States, the first being the Bible. And in those days, you know, they didn't have TV, movies, or social media. So reading was a big source of, you know, entertainment and the pastime. And so pretty much everybody knew how to read the Bible and had Bible. But Uncle Tom's was the next, and Uncle Tom was a book in which she was making a case against slavery. And she made such a good case that when the war started, uh, she actually was invited to the White House by Abraham Lincoln. And Lincoln said to her, and so you are the young lady who started this war. <laughs> and you could argue that in fact, um, people who read the book became so enraged against slavery, the unfairness of it, that uh, you could argue she did sway sentiment in that direction. Okay, so in 1852, you had the Kansas-Nebraska Act passed, and uh, that would allow the territory in Kansas to vote and Nebraska to vote on slavery. So what happened is you had a lot of people who were for slavery, not living in Kansas, coming into Kansas so they could vote, and also people who were against slavery coming into Kansas. She had clashes in Kansas, armed clashes, so much so that actually there were two state capitals for a while in Kansas one a pro-slavery capital, one an anti-slavery capital. Uh, but anyway, uh, that really was one of the things that exacerbated tensions. And another thing that was the lead up, one of the lead ups to the, uh, to the Civil War. In 1856, you had Senator Charles Sumner was an abolitionist, pretty famous abolitionist, a pretty famous senator back then, who in the Senate floor, you know, we think now, you know, they're rude on the Senate floor then. <laughs> In 1856, uh, a representative came up to Sumner and almost beat him to death with a cane on the Senate floor. And by the way, he was not prosecuted for that. So, I mean, you know, we think things are bad now. If you know history, they've been worse. And, you know, as much as a divided nation we are now, I mean, for the most part, we're not killing each other to the extent of 620 to 750,000 dead. So the nation's seen worse times. And I would argue the 60s was actually more civil disobedience and civil disorder than now. So if you have a sense of history, whatever happens in the present may not look so bad, or at least you put it into perspective. It's not like it's the end of the world. Okay, so anyway, that was not good. In 1857, very famous Supreme Court decision. You probably learned it when you were in school, the Dred Scott decision, it's named after the person who brought the case, Dred, a case brought against him, Tred Scott, who was a uh, slave who was free for a while. He said he should keep his freedom. And so he sued. The case went up to the Supreme Court where Roger Tawney, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, led the uh, majority in a ruling that said, no, not only can you not go free, you're not even a human being. Blacks are property. And so it's not like we can free property. If you're property and you're in another state, it's not like, uh, you know, if I take my camera to California, it's not like I lose ownership of the camera, right? So if you take a slave to another state, it's not like you own ownership of the slaves. The person's like, you know, like a piece of furniture. You don't own, I mean, that's really a, a terrible way to look at human beings. And Tony is rightly, um, in, as a legacy, as a poor legacy for Tony. But you know, you could argue he's the product of the time and that's how he felt and it was sad, but that was the law of the land then, slaves of property. Okay, so there's a, uh, a picture, remember I said North Carolina versus man, where the idea that slaveholders had absolute authority over their slaves and could not be uh, convicted of committing violence against them. So you could just, you know, whipping was popular, lashing was popular, other, other things were popular. Uh, that's the caning of Charles Sumner. There's the uh, poor General Sumner. And by the way, he, was, he couldn't actually, op he fortunately survived and was back in the Senate three years later and uh, still advocating for strong abolition. So, you know, good for him. Uh, there's the Dred Scott decision. There's Dred Scott on the right. And there's Roger Tawney, who was the head of the, the um, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. That's his ruling on the case. And you know, it's interesting, you know, the idea that the Supreme Court makes rulings and operates on precedent, which is true in large part, but they can also simply overturn precedent whenever they want. You know, right now, everyone's 
not everyone, but people, many people are worried the Supreme Court's gonna overturn Roe versus Wade, which I think will probably happen even though it's president. And the truth is, it's not like law is chemistry. You know, law is subjective. Even though it's written in a book, people interpret it and people can interpret it differently. And same thing with presidents. Uh, in 1896, the Supreme Court ruled separate but equal was the law of the land. 1954, in the Brown versus Board of Education decision, they said, no, separate but equal is unconstitutional. So it's very important who the judges are, the, who they said the justices are in the Supreme Court because they are the law of the land. It's not what's written, it's how they interpret it that's the law of the land. Okay, so uh, then, so now we're to uh, the start, we're gonna be at the start of the Civil War in 1859, famous John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. John Brown was a, uh, an insurrectionist who thought this was a federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. He thought he'd get there, get the weapons, give it to the slaves and we'd lead a revolt. Uh, sad for him, it didn't work. Um, soldiers came to Harper's Ferry, interestingly enough, led by Robert E. Lee, who at that time was a uh, officer in the Union, not, well, in the Federal Army, the U.S. Federal Army, the South hadn't seceded. So he was in the uh, the U.S. Army and he, they got John Brown, quick trial, and they hung. So that was one of the things that happened. So uh, the Civil War, then of course, seven states uh, seceded when Lincoln became president. In 1860, Lincoln was president. By the way, Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln was lucky to become president. He was a Republican, the first Republican. The Republicans were a new party back then. They may be a new party in the future, who knows? But back then they were a new party. They were the former Whig party. It was also a new party that started after another party. So parties change. But anyway, he was the first Republican. He was elected president with a little under 40% of the popular vote. He did have the electoral vote, but uh, obviously more than 60% of the country did not vote for Lincoln in the first election. Uh, and interestingly enough, he only won because the Democrats were divided. The South put up their own Democrat and the North and the rest of the country had another Democrat. The South had a guy by the name of Breckinridge and the North had Stephen Douglas, who you might've heard from from the Lincoln-Douglas debate. So Lincoln was running against a divided Democratic party which is, which is nice if you can do it, right? You wanna run against a party which has two prominent candidates because they'll split the vote and so you'll, you'll win. So when he was elected president, seven states seceded and they seceded because they thought Lincoln, who really said he wasn't gonna get rid of slavery, kept telling the South, I'm in, slavery's in, not gonna take it out of the, out of the constitution, not gonna advocate for it. But they were worried these new states coming into the union that Lincoln was gonna push it. And Lincoln didn't say that he wouldn't. And so they were worried that the new states would be, as I said before, uh, free states, and that would give them a problem. So they seceded. And then on April 12th, 1861, that's why it's called the 160th anniversary, because it happened back then, uh, the South uh, in South Carolina fired on Fort Sumter, and that was the start of the Civil War. I mean, Lincoln wanted the South to fire the first shot. And was, you know, he sort of engineered that. And then once they fired on Fort Sumter, the war was on. And in 1861, four more states seceded, and then you had 11 states, you know, in the Confederacy. So the first big battle was the Battle of Bull Run, and that was right outside of Washington, and the South won a pretty decisive uh, victory, which shocked the North. I mean, the North thought this was going to be an easy war, just like the start of World War I. Every nation thought, oh, this is going to be easy, you know, we'll be over before a few months. And same thing with the Battle of Bull Run. People actually from Washington took picnic lunches to the battlefield to watch the North. They figured beat the South. And when the South started advancing and the North started retreating, all those picnickers ran back to Washington. It looked like it had the South actually kept going. They probably could have gone into Washington, but they were so tired they stopped. Probably a mistake. Anyway, uh, the Battle of Bull Run, the South won. And then the, then the North then had a realized it was gonna have a fight in his hand. And then the North had to you know, come up with armies and generals. And in the beginning, they came up with the bad generals, which was sad. Eventually they got a good one, but they prolonged the war. Uh, so there were a lot of battles that, I mean, I could spend uh, days talking about the Civil War and the battles. And I'm guessing many of you may know that because the Civil War is such a popular topic. People just seem to love learning about the Civil War. And I can understand why. Guides particularly, I find, really love, love learning about the battles and the strategy. 
Anyway, uh, the Battle of the Antietam is a big battle, which uh, arguably Lincoln, uh, the North wins, although you could argue either way, but it was enough of a victory that Lincoln was able to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. And this Emancipation Proclamation, many people think that Lincoln freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation, but he didn't. He freed only the slaves in the Southern states, because those were the states in rebellion. Lincoln actually called the Civil War, not the Civil War, he called it the War of the Rebellion. So it was, you know, he didn't want to call it the Civil War, and that was probably a good move. The War of the Rebellion actually is good because he's on the side to quash the rebellion, so that was good. Uh, also, Lincoln never recognized the South as a separate nation, which was also probably a smart move. So uh, the Emancipation Proclamation lets the, uh, if the Union can come and free, uh, you know, land, those people on that land are free, the Blacks on that land are free, that was it. And you know, Len Lincoln would say, well, they're property, right? And so if the union can free and the property, you can go. <laughs> kind of clever. But he couldn't say every slave is free because the constitution at that time still had slavery in it. So the border states, you know, Kentucky, Delaware, Maryland, they could keep their slaves because they weren't for the South. They hadn't seceded. And so Lincoln couldn't have free the slaves in their states unless he go against the constitution. But he did slaves, free the slaves in the 11 states if the slaves could you know, get their freedom. Obviously, if the North, if the army wasn't in a farm and you were on a farm in the South, you could argue you were free. But if the slave owner had the guns, then you know, good luck to you. So uh, there's a, this was the presidential election of 1860, where we have Lincoln. As I said, he ran against these two from the uh, Democrats, Douglas and uh, Breckinridge, and he also ran against John Bell, who was a third party candidate who siphoned all votes. So, you know, from a political standpoint, Lincoln had a good deal. From a governance standpoint, Lincoln inherited a war. The president before Lincoln was a guy by the name of James Buchanan, who, when they do the list of presidential rankings, is typically ranked as the worst president. And he's ranked as the worst president because he simply didn't do anything when the states talked to secession. He just left the issue alone and he was just biding his time till he could get out of office and Lincoln would come in. And when Lincoln came in, he said, well, now it's your problem. So uh, people, you know, the, the people who do the rankings don't like that. Okay, so that's the firing on Fort Sumter. That's the start in South Carolina, the start of the Civil War. That's the Emancipation Proclamation on uh, Jan the Juneteenth is something different, but uh, Juneteenth is June 19th, actually 1865, uh, which is coming up, by the way, in uh, uh, you know next month. I'm doing lectures on Juneteenth, which is interesting. Uh, it's an interesting holiday. Uh, Juneteenth actually uh, happened when a uh, federal general uh, came to Galveston, Texas and said to the folks in Galveston, by the way, the war is over. And that was news to them because Texas was so far out of the fighting and, you know, they didn't have phones and internet or social media. So, you know, information traveled by railroad. That's how you got it. And so, you know, the, tech, the slaves didn't know. So when he brought that, that, that news, that was great news to them. So it's sort of been made a holiday now uh, nationally. I mean, it's not a formal national holiday and typically states do it. Um, in Texas, by the way, it's a state holiday. You know, we think about Texas as such a conservative state, but it's a state holiday where state workers can stay home. So, I mean, Blacks achieve that in Texas, which is interesting. And eventually maybe a national holiday, um, but we'll see. But anyway, that's Juneteenth. But the Emancipation Proclamation was issued January 1st, 1863, um, which I think that might've been a national holiday, except the fact that it was on January 1st. And I think People are worried about that if you made that a national holiday, um, it would compete with New Year's Day, where people just aren't going to be thinking that much of you know our, our history. They just want to get over hangovers, so you don't want January first to be the date. So Juneteenth may be a good day to for recognition of uh, emancipation. Okay. So anyway, the Civil War continued. Uh, July first, a third famous battle. I'm sure you've heard of it, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, the North won that battle, and at that battle, Lincoln delivered his famous Gettysburg Address, which wasn't famous at the time. Most people didn't think of it. Only later did they realize how really wonderful it was. And it was a short address. It was 269 words. 
And it was a dress that Lincoln was giving as a memorial for the dead. You know, there's so many soldiers that died, he was giving this memorial for the dead. And he said basically that we here resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from the earth. I mean, among great speeches in American history, that's right up there. So of course, uh, Lincoln gets lucky. Uh, he gets a good general. He had a bunch of bad generals uh, who really, I mean, the North should have won that war in many ways. That's so many more men. They had so much more war material than 90% of the factories, uh, you know, more railroads. Although arguably the South was fighting on their own soil. So it's harder, it's easier when you're fighting on your own soil, you know, the land, uh, you know, you can, the defense often has it easier than the offense. So arguably the South could have won that war. Lee made some mistakes too. His biggest one I guess, is Gettysburg where he came up North to fight. Had he stayed in the South, he probably could have prolonged the war a lot longer and the North might've gotten tired of it. But I think he got a bit too cocky and you know came up north and he fought at Gettysburg and that was a mistake. Anyway, when Grant comes in, like, he's, he's the famous general that, that, that finally turns the tide. And one of the reasons is he doesn't mind taking losses. I mean, the losses in the Civil War, these battles were atrocious, 20,000 men, 30, you know, 30,000, 15,000 killed in battle in a few days. I mean, appalling losses. Um, but Grant, and typically after one of these big battles, the Northern Army would retreat. But with Grant, even if he doesn't do well in a battle, he doesn't retreat, he pushes on. And his thought is, no matter how many men I lose, they'll replace them. We got lots of men in the North. You know, I didn't do so well today. I'll do better tomorrow, but I'm not going back. And it was great for the morale of the troops because they were finally not retreating. So, and Lincoln just was ecstatic. He said, oh, finally I have a general who will fight. And one of the jokes were that uh, Grant, you know, was a bit of a drinker and Lincoln said, find out what he's drinking and send it to all my other generals, doing a good job. Anyway, uh, finally, you know, Grant defeats the South. The South really, you know, runs out of men, runs out of territory and Lee surrenders at Appomattox. That really was the end of the Civil War because there were other Southern armies in the field. But that was the biggest one in symbolic, and they pretty much the other army surrendered the next few months. But that was the biggest one. And on April 9th, 1865, almost four years to the date of the firing on Fort Sumter, General Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, which is famous, go down to it today, you can see it. And so, um, and Grant gave him very good terms to surrender. I mean, you know, they could have made it tough on the surrender on the troops. They said, no, tell the men to go home, the officers can keep their horses. And weapons, just tell you men to leave their rifles here, go home, go to the farms, get the harvest in. Very liberal surrender terms, really good terms. And Lee was thankful for that. Uh, and then uh, uh, less than a week later, Lincoln is assassinated, right, in Ford's Theater. John Wilkes Booth sneaks in, kills him. Who knows what Reconstruction would have looked like had Lincoln lived. But that's with history, you can do as ifs all you want. He didn't live and Andrew Johnson became president. And it looked like what it was. So there's the Battle of Gettysburg, very famous battle. Lee surrendering to Grant. Uh, Lee actually was wearing sort of shoddy outfits, battle outfit, Grant, uh, no, Lee was all dressed up. Grant was wearing sort of a shoddy outfit. Uh, Grant really wanted to make Lee feel like, you know, what, Welcome, and I mean, they were both generals. They both served with each other in the in the military. They both gone to West Point together, and so uh, you know, Grant didn't want to stick it to Lee, and he didn't. There's Lincoln being assassinated, real tragedy, uh, and then of course the war is over. Now we have Reconstruction, and the idea is now you're going to have to reconstruct the South. And so the 13th Amendment is passed finally in December of 1865, and the 13th Amendment ends slavery everywhere. So now it's in the Constitution, even the border states, that's it for slavery. And so once slavery is over, the Ku Klux Klan gets formed. The first Klan is formed, right? Still around today. 1865, you have the establishment of the Freedmen's Bureau. That's a bureau that's going to kind of help with the reconstruction. Uh, they have in the president, uh, at the link of the assassination, there's a fellow by the name of Andrew Johnson. 
who happened to have been before a, a senator from Tennessee, the only uh, the only senator from the South who stayed with the North. And he really, he did. Johnson just hated rich Southern planters. And I think that's why he stayed with the North. He was, it was a class thing, not a race thing. He just hated rich Southern planters. He still hated blacks, but he hated rich Southern planters. And so that was the deal. Uh, in 1868, you had the adoption of the 14th Amendment because the South was still sticking it to the blacks. So in the 14th Amendment, it said, uh, you're a citizen of this country if you're born in this country. And by the way, that's why we have today people that fly in, you know, for, to have babies here and they're born here to become citizens. That wasn't what the 14th Amendment was for. It was really to make sure that the blacks were gonna be citizens, but it was the law. So now anybody born here, whether you're here legally or not, you're a citizen. Uh, an interesting law. We're in the only developed country that has it. Uh, okay, so in, uh, so Grant now, after Johnson uh, was almost impeached, by the way, uh, in February 24th, 1868, uh, the, uh, the more liberal part of the Senate and the House wanted to impeach him. They didn't think he was moving fast enough on Reconstruction. They thought it was too pro-South. And he was impeached and he was almost convicted. One, by one vote in the Senate, he wasn't convicted. Uh, and he was really brought up on phony charges. Uh, the charges were that um, they said that the president didn't have a right to, f to fire civil servants without going through the Senate for approval. And Johnson said, that's ridiculous. And he, in fact, he was right because, uh, I don't know, 50 or 60 years later, the Supreme Court ruled he was right because no one was around by then. But uh, he had the law on his side, but they impeached him. And so that was it. Okay, so when in 1868, I said the 14th Amendment, then Grant, after Johnson is, uh, uh, steps down, Grant's elected president, and uh, he's a president for two terms. And during Grant's uh, time of office, you have Reconstruction. Also, you have in 1870, the adoption of the 15th Amendment, and that amendment that gives people the right to vote. Um, and of course, the states make the rules. That's the way they wrote the amendment. They didn't have to, they could have said the federal government would make the rules, in which case you wouldn't have all these, you know, different states trying to get people not to vote. They wouldn't have the power, it would be the federal government in charge, which is, can be good or bad. Now that, you know, Trump was elected, who knows what the federal government would have done with voting. So uh, you could argue it either way. Anyway, Reconstruction, the idea was you wanted to get the blacks uh, into society, and they were. Many blacks were voted into office in some of these Southern states. Uh, they, they, were, they had integration, they could ride on public transportation with whites and then you know, reconstruction. And the reason it worked was because you had federal troops in the South. And without troops, the whites wouldn't get a lick, let the blacks have anything. But with troops there, you know, the gun, the gun does loud talking, as they say. But um, in 1877, Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president in a really crazy election. That's an election you want to read about. I mean, do you think any of the elections, like the Gore election with Bush was sort of odd. The Hayes election was weirder. Uh, I won't go into everything, but Google it. Anyway, the Compromise of 1877, Hayes was Republican, made a deal with the Democrats. He said, look, because there were some states that the Electoral College votes were up for grabs, and the Democrats said, okay, you can have these electoral votes. But in return, don't forget the South is now Democrat. Not today, it's Republican, but back then it was Democrat. So the South said, look, you can have the electoral votes that are in dispute, you could be President Hayes. But in return, you gotta pull the troops out of the South. And Hayes did, he wanted to be president. And once the troops are out, bad for the blacks, right? Because uh, then any rights they had, the South, you know, whatever the law is, you still have to have soldiers or police to enforce it. And if the law can't be enforced, you know, really what good is the law? And it wasn't enforced, so the South, did all, they put in poll taxes, literacy taxes, blacks were lynched, uh, mobs would go against black people. And you know, it wasn't like we have a civil rights division today. It was just brutal. Uh, there's the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, uh, which is the prelude to radical Republican reconstruction. There's Grant being elected president. There's his vice president, I forget his name. Uh, the end of Reconstruction, the start of the Ku Klux Klan. There they are, and all their masks. <laughs> they were wearing masks before we were. Um, okay, so Reconstruction fails, and uh, now you have this. Now you know we have this uh, brouhaha 
about uh, about these monuments, right? Uh, Confederate monuments. Well, believe me, the South wasn't putting up monuments right after the Civil War. The North wouldn't have let them, right? I mean, you lose a war, we're not gonna let you put up monuments to your generals. Those were the generals that were killing our troops and we won, not happening. So during reconstruction, no monuments. But once the soldiers pulled out, the South, people in the South said, you know, we didn't do so bad, we should honor our own. And so basically in the late 19th century, early 20th century, they put up all these monuments, you know, to their generals and to, you know, Lee, Beauregard and, you know, all these other folks. And, um, okay, but it's interesting because you could argue that, gee, you know, it's a rebellion against the country. I mean, that's really the definition of being a traitor. I mean, a traitor means you, you take arms against your country. So all these people by the standard definition were traitors and they had monuments. But, you know, if you don't object, that's what happens. And if you did object, you have the eternal resentment of people living down there. So it's always tricky. It's always tricky how you balance these things out. But anyway, the South was really in bad shape after the Civil War. The North, not so much. You know, when you win a war, like in the, the US in World War II, you know, the 1950s was a very good era for the US. It was after the war, we hadn't been touched. Uh, you know, Europe was devastated, China, Japan, Russia, they were all destroyed. Our infrastructure was perfect. So if you live in the 1950s, if, you know, I'm old enough to remember, but if you are, the economy was unbelievable. You know, we grow like four and a half percent a year, jobs for everyone. I'm talking union jobs with benefits. I mean, because we were making stuff for the whole world. So it was just a terrific time in the country economically, not, not in other ways, but economically. Uh, in any event, uh, but after the Civil War, the Northern wealth was increasing because you know, so, many, so much industry had done so much industry, so much money around. So the, between 1860 and 1870, Northern wealth, wealth increased to 60 by 60%. Southern wealth fell by 50%. Don't forget, lots of the battles were fought in the South. So there, there, and also the, the Northern armies devastated the South. Now Sherman's march through the South, and not only Sherman, other armies, they destroyed whatever was there, you know, buildings, farms, factories, railroads, ripped everything up. And so the South was devastated. And to this day, you know, the reason the South isn't doing as well as the rest of the country is because they started behind, you know, it's like in a race. If you're given, or in golf, if you're given a handicap, which was the North got a handicap, right? So the North has got a handicap and, and, and you know, it's got amazing advantages. Or in a race, let's say, you know, you can start in a mile race, you can start a half mile, the other guy's got to go behind a mile. So you're already half a mile ahead. That's where, where the North was. So, you know, the South is, and to this day, um, it also left a mentality among Southerners that they felt like losers because they were. And as far as the war goes, they lost the war. Um, and so when you lose a war, you feel like, you know, and then they had the conquerors there. So uh, it was, that's tough. I mean, and to this day, there are many people that really feel a kinship to the, to the what happened in that war. And then they, they sort of had um, uh, ways to explain it. And one of that was, the, as I say here, the myth of the lost cause. And that was, the, the war wasn't about slavery, it was about chivalry. Because people back then, if you ever read the novels of uh, Walter Scott, you know, wrote novels about the sh about chivalry, and so the idea was, well, it was a way of life back then. It wasn't about slavery; it was the way of life, the genteel way of life back then, when people were polite to each other in society and everything like that. And uh, we were fighting for this lost cause, the gentility, and not the crass northern northerners. Uh, but of course, uh, it's about slavery, and uh, you know, I don't know how you justify that, but to be, believe in the myth of the lost cause, you're allowed to believe whatever you like, right? It's a free country. So that's the deal. Um, so certainly the South had a grudge for the North. It's arguably still do, although now many Northerners are retiring to the South. So with new people, that'll change. And, um, and so, but, that, but that grudge was definitely there. And um, one, of the, one of the grudges, the Confederate flag, you know, was, was always a big symbol of rebellion. You know, now it's finally disappearing from the state flags, but still people fly the Confederate flag down south. 
In the Egotary up north, many people will argue, well, we're not just for the Confederacy, it's a, it's a symbol of uh, rebellion. Yeah, so the swastika is a symbol of rebellion, but why are you flying it? It's not a, it's not a good thing. It's a flying traitorous group and they, they lost. So, but, you know, again, it's a free country and you can fly a flag like that. Uh, anyway, um, of course, one of the other enduring legacies is the racism we have, although, you know, the blacks were free and these amendments were passed, the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. Uh, you can pass all the laws you want, but you can't change people's minds with a law. You can't pass a law and say, you know, this law says you can't think X and X. Uh, you can't do that, which is good. And so, uh, and we couldn't enforce it anyway. How do you know what people think? But the point is, um, you know, how do you change people's thoughts? And uh, I guess that's the, on, since the Civil War, that's really been the ongoing thing. How do you change people's thoughts so that they're more accepting of a pluralistic society where if, you know, if you're, whatever your skin color is, if you're an American, you're an American. And so obviously there's tons of racism still in the country. And uh, the Civil War didn't end racism, it just ended slavery. It wasn't a war about racism. And by the way, many of the Northerners who fought in the Civil War were racist. Uh, many of the soldiers felt the same way the Southerners did. Blacks were inferior, both mentally, not physically. They felt Blacks were okay physically. They, that's what they were meant for, to do farm work and uh, you know, industrial work, which required physical strength. Most, North, most whites didn't have a problem with that. But mentally, uh, they didn't have the mental capacity to uh, think well or to be leaders. And many Northerners felt that way. Lincoln certainly, I think, felt in many ways that way. And, and many Northerners felt that way. It was just they didn't feel that one person should own another. So that was that. Was that. Okay, so that's my coda. And now there weren't questions during my talk. So I'll give you a few minutes if you want to ask questions now. Or comments. Although I don't even know if you're there because all I can see is myself. So if I lecture to myself, I did a good job, Marty. But anyway, uh, I'm you hoping you're out there. Um, I'm going to end the recording. And then if anyone wants to um, okay. comment, um, we can do that. But let me just stop that. And thank you again. Thank you. Just one moment. There we go. Okay. I'll